This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool. Hey, folks, welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dame Inga Bill, um, British businesswoman and former CEO of Lloyd's of London. Inga, thanks for joining me. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you, even though it's over the airwaves this time and not in person. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, hopefully next time we'll be face to face sooner rather than later. Uh, I hope so. How's it all going? How are you finding working at home and all of that stuff? Well, for me, I've moved into a time of my career where I'm portfolio director, as they call it. So I've got various non-executive directorships. And therefore, a lot of the time in between physical board meetings, or at least board meetings that used to be in person and are now done virtually. Yeah. I was usually working at home anyway. We had my home office set up. I was very used to using technology. And while it is a big, big difference, it's much more different for me in my social life, actually, than my professional life. Because I yeah. used to be out all the time, spending time with family, with friends, always going out theatre or enjoying a nice restaurant meal. So the bigger impact for me has actually been on the social side of my life rather than on the professional side. But I know for some people, of course, when you're used to going into the office all the time. And I remember when I introduced home working and flexible working many years ago in the office, I would get a response from a lot of people saying, there's no way I'm going to work from home. You know, I, want, I like to come mm. into the office. I like to see everyone. Now, for those people, this must be a real shock. Massively. Do you think this will completely change the way people work or will people just revert to like the good old ways they were working before? Well, uh, people, some people will have learned new ways of working. And I think they'll be relishing, they'll be really enjoying some aspects. When you work virtually like this, it does give you a lot more flexibility in your day. Yeah, And true. I think once people are used to the fact that actually I can be just as productive, maybe even more productive by not doing my hourly, two hourly commute every day. And I can actually, you know, spend more time doing other things that I want, spend more time at home. It could change the way people approach remote working yeah i think particularly also for managers because there are some managers and leaders that think oh gosh if i can't see my employees in the office yeah. i don't know that they're actually working True. and i think well when people obviously it takes a little while to get used to this new way of working virtually but a lot of people will see gosh my team are just as productive we're thinking more creatively perhaps thinking of new ways of working and yeah. they'll see the benefits of it I think one of the key things that I've always found, though, is when you want to be most creative, you've got to get people talking to each other. Yeah. When I, you know, when people are too on their own all the time, not necessarily do the great ideas come along. It's almost as though when you have two people talking about something, a third mastermind appears, where suddenly yeah. you come up with the most amazing idea because you've sparked off each other. And yeah. I think that's one thing that's key to get right with this way of working is to encourage still that conversation, whatever means it's, whatever medium, media it's yeah. taking place over, basically to make sure you encourage that. But then okay. if you can see that your teams are still performing, I think it could really revolutionize how managers think of teams and how productive they are. Yeah, people will be much more open to having a virtual team and being able to, you know, different people want to work differently. Um, there's no one size fits all. So as long as people are open to other people's ways of working, I think that would be awesome. Interestingly, the more people I speak to right now, a lot of people, it's it's affecting their mental health a lot, being kind of stuck at home. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how many people 
can and are more productive at home versus you know craving that like social interaction right because we are human and we like to, to meet and be face to face so it'll be interesting to see that it probably depends a lot on your home circumstances doesn't it if yeah. you're living alone at home you could probably end up never leaving your computer you know you're just stuck at your desk yeah. all the time because there's yeah. no real distraction whereas i think if you're living with others particularly young families you you know the chances are you are going to be distracted in all sorts of ways that you don't necessarily get distracted by um when you're in the office environment mm. that's true so you mentioned you mentioned it's impacted your social life more than anything are you using like what apps are you using are you doing kind of like zoom dinner parties and like house parties and how are you keeping like in, interacting with all of your friends and stuff yeah we're trying all the, the various um, apps and tools that are out there. We had to give up using one, Zoom, we were using the other day. Yeah. It seemed to be so crowded on the airwaves, that didn't work because there were quite a, yeah. it was quite a group of us. So we gave up with yeah. that. We, we then switched to house party, I think, on that. Yeah. But otherwise, we use Messenger, group chats, WhatsApp group chats. People are using Microsoft Teams meetings. Yeah, and yeah. Or work. I think you're using, what, Google Hangouts? Google Hangouts, so yeah. There's yeah. A, such a multiple of choice out there. Yeah. And um, I don't know, some of them have their pros, some of them have their cons. A lot of the time, particularly for one-on-one, -on -one, almost any of them work, don't they? It's great, yeah. Mm -hmm. I found myself being more social than ever. I was like speaking to my a couple of um, friends from uni at 8.30 in the morning on my little morning walk before I start work on house party. And we were saying we haven't spoken at 8.30 in the morning midweek for like ever. <laughs> I'm like, it's great. I'm like, I think I'm speaking to my friends more. I'm speaking to customers more and people that I work. I mean, it's just, it feels really social. I do a 2 p.m. video call with all of my team every day. And I'm probably speaking to them more now than I was when I was sitting next to them. Because <laughs> you like feel well, the... Then, yeah, and then that's a great thing to learn, isn't it? Going through this way of working. Let's make sure that we keep up this more, you know, communication. And yeah. particularly, I found that friends that I, I perhaps wouldn't have spoken to maybe more often than once every two months i'm now speaking to once every two weeks yeah so yeah. it's kind of bringing people together in a way that we've yeah. absolutely we've lost touch of a little bit that's true yeah. um, when do you think when do you think we'll be back in the office now a million dollar know. question i don't know if we look at i was looking at china about what's happening in china and particularly wuhan yeah. and so they were basically in lockdown you know for yeah. two months or so but even when they opened up they still haven't opened up fully while they've let people arrive into the city they're still being very very strict on checking them and things are not back to usual yet right and therefore we've got to think at least probably three months haven't we here in the uk yeah um i hope that the six months that some people have talked about it just isn't going to be reality from my sense what i'm hearing and reading about some of the countries that went into lockdown earlier than the uk particularly in other parts of europe they're already now talking about their exit strategies so it's how okay. they're going to start letting people yeah. mingle and meet a bit more so there is some hope some light at the end of the tunnel yeah and i just hope that you know three months would be the max let's hope it doesn't go beyond that but we really that's too early to tell at the moment no no we'll see what's really interesting and, and governments are having to do this already is almost put a price on life because you obviously have the lockdown which affects the economy and you know they've got these impossible decisions to make about do you go do you open up? Is that going to risk more people dying? The economy, I mean, it's a very, very tough thing for them to, you know, to decide. Yeah, I think one thing for sure, people are agreed that the it is going to have a huge economic impact that is going to ripple on much longer than maybe the physical side of people getting infected. Because if people are going through this period of not earning any money or they're earning very little money, you've got businesses that might have been, or might collapse, still might collapse yeah. the coming months. The impact on the economy economy then is going to have a wave, a sort of another wave where people don't have the money to put into the economy as they did. So that yeah. is going to be in the longer run in a way more severe. Massively. I remember when we met only a few months ago, um, Brexit was on everyone's lips. And uh, it's interesting now, I mean, I'm probably the first person that's mentioned it in, <laughs> you know, a month or two. So it's, it's interesting how quickly things change. And this is being, you know, being a natural disaster. It's quite humbling when, you know, there's nothing you can do i mean it's mother nature saying like stay in your room for six months and let me sort myself out i mean in a way it seems so 
silly that we were so worried and het up about Brexit, doesn't it? And you wonder, <laughs> why did we even bother with that whole thing? <laughs> Look at how powerful the world really is. And these are the things we should need to focus on. And of course, yeah. being, um, well, I've been in the world of insurance for 38 years. Yeah. We've been used to dealing with disasters. And I've every time some physical, natural disaster comes along, you realize how powerless we are as humans you know yeah. if there's an earthquake or flooding and then you realize isn't mother nature powerful yeah. um and this is a, this is mother nature in another way this is a disease that's spreading that seems to make humans just so powerless yeah. it, it puts everything into perspective mm. it really does how how can how can leaders lead through these times i mean we haven't seen this I mean, let's say for 10 years or so, um, obviously the, the kind of the startup community, the SME sector is really big in the UK and a lot of people haven't ever experienced this. What, what can kind of leaders do to, to navigate through this? One thing is not to panic. And I, it feels as though we've got over the panic um, or the first round of panicking. But I still, in some of the conversations I have, there still seem to be some business leaders who are tending to think of it in a panicking way. And that's the worst thing to do. It's the worst thing for your clients, worst thing for your employees. You as a leader now have to show that you're being thoughtful, considered. You may not know all the answers and you need them, your people, to help you come up with the answers. But don't, whatever it is, panic. Think very carefully about what you need to do. And think also about the outcome. In other words, what can you do to make sure that you're still around and still able to operate to make good when things, when we get through the crisis? Yeah. yeah. The other thing I think for leaders, and leaders often talk about this, but it is so important now, is you'll communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah. And you don't have to be the guru who has all the answers. You just need to be able to communicate freely, openly, and get interaction with your people. Never as important as now. Your people, but also your clients. Nobody's expecting you to know all the answers. This is the other thing. They know yeah. you're not superhuman. But to show that you're doing things in a measured way and that you're keeping them as, as informed as possible, that to me is one of the most important things. Definitely. The other thing is a lot of businesses, and maybe not so much the smaller ones, and perhaps there are services that they can go to that are provided for by charitable organizations. But bigger businesses tend to provide um, hotlines and services for their employees where they can reach out, maybe get help if they've got some mental health issues or some other things that are troubling them. So many big employers will provide helplines. But if you're not one of those big employers, but you still want to make sure you're helping your employees, get them, put them in touch with all of these charities and the charitable organizations that will yeah. therefore then provide mental health help. There's, um, I was promoting a site called Mental Health First Aid England, okay. the charity right. out there. It's got lots of tips and things you can use to work from home, to lead and guide teams. And there are all sorts of charitable organizations out there that you can encourage your teams, your employees, if they need it, to reach out to. Definitely. No, because it's, it's difficult because if you're if people are at home, you don't really know how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. They might put a, a brave face on in a video call. Um, but once that video call's, call's finished, I mean, especially if someone's living on their own, as you as you touched on before, it can be quite a lonely place and you know, everyone's mood goes up and down. So, I mean, it's, it's good to touch base with them individually as often as possible just to make sure people are okay i think it is and that can be on an ad hoc basis yeah but also to have something structured so i think you mentioned that you're having these daily calls with your team yeah. that to me is very important because particularly if you're on your own and perhaps you're not actually engaged in that much virtual work maybe you're having to do a lot of work actually on your own if you see nothing that you're sort of preparing for, looking forward to, that can be really tough. So yeah. get, some, get some time in the calendar, get some social time where maybe it's not a work catch up. Maybe it's just a catch up at the end of the week. Perhaps we're going to have virtual cake eating together or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a purely social activity. But get it in the calendar so that people, particularly if they're on their own, they know that something is going to be happening for them that they yeah. can join. Because otherwise that can feel if you're sort of looking out and there's nothing in sight for you to engage with people in a structured way, that can be really tough. 100%. Also, 
don't read the papers in the morning. It's like you end up having a diet of negativity before you even start. And there's probably nothing that interesting in the papers right now anyway. And one thing I'm finding finding quite difficult to get to, although I do tend to read The Economist, which is one of my favourite publications, um, is to get news for, from on anything that isn't coronavirus related. Yeah. And really trying to seek that out, and particularly things that are happening in other parts of the world. I'm still, I want to know what's going on in the rest of the world. And that can be quite tough when you're in your own country or your own local community, you're hit by such a crisis as we're in now. Um, you're sort of hungry for information about what's going on in your own environment. But I so want to know what's going on in the rest of the world still. 100%. I was supposed to be in Cape Town right now seeing my grandma. Uh -huh. And, you know, flights got cancelled. Obviously, they don't want anyone from the UK coming in. Um, but just, just looking at, you know, their response, which is completely different to the UK response, and just, you know, seeing what's going on, absolutely. The one thing I... I've really disliked at the moment is my WhatsApp groups. Everyone's forwarding, you know, my friends, 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 boyfriends, sister works in the NHS and, you know, or, and so people are forwarding this, you know, fake news, maybe fake, maybe not, but, you know, perceived wisdom around. And it feels like it just fuels up, you know, the, the anxiety. I know. And I, I've had a lot of those, not now, but I did have a lot. And I kept going back to to anyone who was sending me this saying just go and check the fact check fact check on the bbc website yeah all of these myths um they'll have somebody telling you how why they're not true so i often used to send people back to that but south africa there is a lovely actual video the um a choir in south africa put together um it's really basic telling people about washing their hands and you know how you should the basic things you should do to keep yourself as safe as possible throughout coronavirus. And it is the most wonderful, uplifting song that I've oh. ever come across. Oh, read it. That, that's great there. I mean, obviously, the, the healthcare system is quite poor. Um, a lot of people are living in, you know, one room. So the virus can spread so quickly. A lot of respiratory uh, diseases. So they've been very, um, let's call it militant on it. But, but they've really been able to keep the cases down. They have. Um, but I don't believe you're even allowed out to walk your dog there, which is quite... Well, they are. the army are allowed to shoot. Um, so And you have to have papers if you're going to the shops and stuff. My grandma, she's 98. And so they've uh, they've locked down her old age home that she's in now, just keeping it really tight. But, but you know, in that society, that's what they've got to do, you know, versus like Sweden. I think they still have the schools open and you can still cruise around. <laughs> they, they've taken a very different approach and even a very different approach amongst the Nordic countries. Yeah. They're, um, and they don't, at the moment, uh, they have not had a high prevalence of infection rates. So it's quite extraordinary. And of course, what we'll all do, we'll have hindsight, we'll look back at all of this, but we will learn, learn yeah. something for the future. Yeah. Um, and hopefully then the next time something like this happens, we're better prepared. I'm interested to see um, in hindsight, if leaders are scrutinized for the decisions they make in this kind of wartime scenario and, and whether that might stop people making the decisions that they need to make. People are always being scrutinized and criticized. I mean, you've only got to look at the government's criticism that there's been here about speed yeah. of action. Yeah. And that is out there all the time. Yeah. One would hope that um, People don't deserve to be called a leader, though, if they're not taking any action. And I think by not taking any action, even within your own small environment, your small business, that will then be remembered and would be equally criticised. Because even if you might not make all the right decisions, as I said, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But you made decisions and that's what people want to see in leaders, that you actually have courage to go out there and, and take initiative and show some leadership definitely i wonder whether we're going to learn from this and evolve or do you think we're going to just revert back to the good old ways of polluting our planet consumerism or are we just going to just take stock and be like do you know what there's more important things and let's maybe take a slightly different path we will adjust a little bit i do believe that i think we this will have been a shock and a bit of a wake-up call to people However, I, ne I never cease to be amazed how greed drives so many things. And I was just reading today about margin calls, okay? Um, thinking about, oh, all of these angry investors and are going to go after, or the banks are going to go after them to get all of the, the loans that they've given them 
um, to invest in, in things. They're going to want that money back. And, and oh dear, there's going to be all these lawsuits coming out. And I'm thinking, gosh, and I really started to think about this. And I thought, God, what makes people think that they want to borrow money, more money, to add to the wealth they already have, to then go and invest in things, hoping to get the benefit out of the upside of that entire investment? And I sort of thought about the principle of thought. Now, that is, that sort of, a certain amount of greed or people just wanting to make more money. And do you think that's really going to go away? I, I, something in me tells me that it's not fundamentally going to disappear from human nature. True. Um, and, but if we could see one leveling out of wealth throughout this, this would be amazing. But I fear again, it's the people at the bottom who have the least who are going to suffer the most. True. And, while we were seeing great strides forward in wealth sharing, so more and more people were being lifted out of poverty, the stats are out there. Yeah. I do fear that actually this could push many more people back into poverty and we're going to have to start lifting them out again. So yeah. will the wealth gap narrow? I don't think this is going to do that. I think it's almost going to do the opposite for a while. Yeah. Well, if you're employed at the moment, you're more wealthy than you were before because everything's cheaper and you're not spending any money and no one wants to go out for dinner with you or lunch if you're unemployed now it's tough absolutely and i think we'll see more and more people become unemployed as you know as this goes on over the next like few years um but hopefully people step in and and, uh, and support them i mean there are some companies hiring um, as if they need it amazon sales have gone through the roof and i think they're hiring a hundred thousand people over the uk and europe some of the supermarkets, I think they've had the, I think they're up like 25% sales or something like that. So, it, you know, there's, there's jobs that you can get if you need it and if you're in that part of the economy. And the National Health Service, I've seen have and, been advertising in the UK to get people to take a career, to sort of actually start a career. Um, yeah. And so, yes, there are, there are places where people are looking to hire right now. But... For me, the, the sad thing is the innovation that was coming through with some of the entrepreneurs starting out on their own little business. Right now, some of them will have had a real knockback. Yeah. And I hope that they can then go through this, come out strong and come back with their innovative ideas and don't give up on some of the great ideas. Definitely. No, definitely. Well, look, I mean, my wife actually works in the NHS. And uh, so it's been quite interesting. I mean, she's actually contributing to society right now much more than I than I do. Um, and she's on the front line. And um, it's interesting. I mean, you know, they're trying to get more protective equipment. There's a really lovely lady I'm speaking to uh, this week who works at Birmingham University. And she is developing with Kings um, like a silicon based mask that they can 3D print specifically for your face. So there's some, you know, there's, there's some amazing things going on. And do you know what, despite all of this bad stuff that's going, it feels like it's putting the country together a lot more. Because when, when we first met and the Brexit stuff, you know, the country felt more divided than ever, you know, very polarised. And now we've all got this shared experience and it. Hopefully the silver lining is that it just brings everyone closer. And I hope that goes across national boundaries though because it yeah the moment or over the past few weeks a lot of the countries were doing different things and they were sort of you know locking themselves in and not necessarily wanting to share with each other so within communities however the communities are defined that community spirit has come to the fore but beyond that big sort of boundaries have and walls have been created to a certain extent haven't they People not wanting to share or wanting to make sure that they're making their own decisions. They don't want to have copied someone else's else's decision. And in business, that's what we do all the time. We're always copying each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, sort of collectively. And for some yeah. reason, countries have been, some countries anyway, have been a little reluctant to actually copy other countries, haven't they? It's been a very, very interesting thing to watch. You know, you're right. I think we'll get out of this as a as a world, you know, as a group of humans rather than as, as individual countries or cities or you're right. But we'll see how that develops. Mm. Well, to you. Um I hope you stay safe and healthy and um I look forward to uh seeing you soon once all this is over. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for including me. Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Mm.